I think we're one minute ahead of schedule, but I think we'll start because there is no more room in this very <laughs> uh, auditorium. So I wish to welcome you all to this session, Cultural Heritage Under Attack. My name is Lisa Nilsson and I have the honor to chair this distinguished panel and this, this session here, organized by the Swedish National Heritage Board, where I work, and it's co-organized with the Swedish National Commission of UNESCO and its Secretary General Mats Julberg, and you're here in the audience. I'm very welcome and very many thanks to you and your group. Uh, before I present the topic of today's discussion, let me introduce this disting distinguished panel of speakers. From the headquarters in Paris of UNESCO, we have the Director General, Irina Bokova. Welcome, Madame Bokova. Thank you. Uh, I guess you found that it's very informal and casual here in Almedalen. How do you find that? Oh, I find uh, here the extraordinary place. First, I saw so many people. We are very impatient, I think, to start this very important uh, discussion. Uh, and of course, uh, we are in the World Heritage Site. Have you this had time to vi visit at all? Yeah. I started with this. Mm -hmm. uh, we visited yesterday with the mayor, with the experts uh, the, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Heritage uh, um, uh, Institute, and, uh, and I feel um, wonderful here. Very good. Yeah. You're I very feel well. at home, huh? yeah, when yeah. I'm in World Heritage, yeah, yeah. I feel at home. <laughs> well, it's your uh, cultural heritage site, isn't it? Uh, next on my list, from the Department of Culture, we have the Minister for Culture and Democracy, Alice Barkunke. Yeah. Very welcome to oh, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Mm. And you're not a stranger to Almedalen, are you? No, uh. I've been here 50 elva gånger. In many different roles, as an activist, as uh, working for an uh, enterprise, uh, and uh, as a general director for an agency, and uh, s uh, now the second or is this the second time or oh, third time as a minister? Uh, 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 yes, it uh, is. Yeah, so 2014. So I mean, and it's very interesting because you, the, you mean, of course, there are some differences when you are here as an activist laying on. I've been in so many schools floors sleeping, so we're laughing when we go home in the night. I slept there, and I, uh, we slept everywhere. And now, as a minister, you sleep in, in a, a bit uh, uh, in a bed at least, uh, and that's good. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, it's the same, and I th I'm so you, I really feel proud. For Sweden, that we still can have this this uh, forum, this uh, this meeting place. I think, and I'm so proud that we can show it for international guests and uh, ministers and politicians and activists from all over Europe and the world. I mean, I, I think we all should be proud to be part of this. Lovely, mm -hmm. thank you. And uh, from the Swedish National Heritage Board, we have its Director General Lars Amreus. Very welcome. And you have been out and about. You were on television this morning. I, I saw you there. Yeah. How do you find it so far? Oh, I, I, I just have to agree with, with Irina and, and Alice. Of course, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place uh, for meetings across different borders, for, for taking in new ideas, for challenging your old ideas. Um, but then again, you know, it can be kind of... Uh, it's hard on you sometimes. I, I met a colleague this morning who said, well, Lars, this morning... I just sat staring at the sea for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, sometimes that's what you have to do in order to just <laughs> get everything to sink in properly. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And last but not least, we have the another, our third director general, in fact, from the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, and that you all is SIDA, of course, and Charlotte Petri Gornitska. Very welcome to you. Thank you. I looked you up in my Almedalen app and I had seven hits on your name. You've been, uh, you've been to many seminars, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think I've learned a lot this year. Uh, the seminars haven't been so given this year. So I just said to Lars that part of my impression this year is that I've learned more than than I've ever done, 50 alva gånger in Almedalen. And I also brought a very, wow. very nice colleague from Myanmar, Burma, Myanmar, mm -hmm. two years ago to the DJ battle. Uh, and, and the thing is, I guess my impression is that lots of fun and lots of serious issues uh, in an open environment like this, it's, it's lovely mm -hmm. and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, and uh, now I will just briefly introduce today's topic to you all, the destruction of cultural heritage, which of course has many faces, such as depriving people from speaking their own language, forced conversion to actual destruction of symbols of that very culture, both during war and during peacetime. Destruction of cultural heritage is not something new to our time. New rulers have always wanted to implement their beliefs by destroying the traditions and cultural expressions of the conquered. It took place in ancient Egypt, throughout Western colonization, during the Reformation in Europe, and it still happens today where books are burned, where heritage sites and objects are destroyed or looted and sold illicitly. And today, many countries have to confront their own history, and Sweden is not an exception. In recent years, the focus of the global community has been on the war in Syria and Iraq. In addition to human suffering, we have witnessed the destruction and plundering of the region's rich cultural heritage, for example, uh, ancient historical sites that are part of our shared heritage. And this systematic and large-scale destruction is an attack on the shared memory of humanity. So what are the forces driving this destruction? And how does it affect our ability to relate to history in order to understand our own future? And what challenges do we now face? And what lessons can we learn for the future? These are, of course, huge challenges. And, and we're very happy to have this knowledgeable panel here to, to try to reply and answer a little here. Uh, and I will start by asking each panelist a question. And I will, ask, I will start with you, Minister. Last year, here in Almadalen, you launched the news that the government intends to present a concerted cultural heritage bill, which is, of course, Kulturarvs Proposition, and you all know that, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, this will be the first time such a bill on cultural heritage is put before Parliament. So why, Minister, is it important right now? And is there any link to the events in the Middle East? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, and, and, and the theme of this discussion uh, is indeed uh, topical, especially in a global context. Uh, culture, as we all know, takes form uh, through an exchange of impressions and ideas. Cultural heritage is a result of culture throughout history, being shaped by people together and in interplay between cultures. This signifies that a person does not belong to one and only one culture. We are all part of several cultures simultaneously. And cultural heritage is something most political. As said, and as we all know, the destruction of artifacts and ancient monuments in Iraq and Syria in recent years bears witness of this fact. We can see that perpetrators of these horrific acts are using the destruction of cultural heritage as means to inspire fear and to drive groups of people apart or even expel certain peoples from their historic home. Meanwhile, far from these conflict zones, other forces are using heritage and history as means to exclude groups from properly entering societies. Nothing makes a group of people more closely united than agreeing on who is different. Cultural heritage must therefore not be formulated in a manner which indicates some people as belonging to certain society and others as an exception which proves that, ru that rule. So it is of, of great importance that all people experience that they can take part in the development of a common heritage. If some groups are excluded from this process, our future heritage will be an incomplete reflection of our history. Aspects of the past become neglected and coming generations misses out on important perspectives. Equal access to our shared cultural heritage should therefore be seen as a democratic right. 
the fact that people and ideas spread at an increasing pace across the world, breaking borders and cultural boundaries along the way, changes the way we need to relate to things and to other people, as well as our sense of belonging and identity. All of these changes are perspective. Now, all of this changes our perception of cultural heritage. So the Ministry of Culture is, uh, as said, in the process of drawing up a government bill on cultural heritage, which is to be presented to Parliament late this year. This bill will touch upon the issues of inclusive identities and social cohesion. It gives the government the opportunity to make clear that cultural heritage is under constant development and must be communicated in a way that everyone can feel belonging and take part on equal terms. The bill can though give cultural heritage a more significant role in the spheres of culture and politics as well as in society in general. So we have high hopes of what the effect of this uh, bill can be. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. My next question will be for you, Madame Bokova. Briefly, if at all possible, what is the role of UNESCO and what is UNESCO doing in concrete terms for cultural heritage in the war torn areas of Iraq, Syria? I wouldn't surprise you at if I say that uh, this is a very important debate for us. It echoes deeply with, uh, with UNESCO's mandate. Uh, just in two days uh, in Istanbul on the 10th, we are opening the next, uh, the annual meeting of the World Heritage Committee. Uh, and it is not by chance that the first day we will immediately make a, a side event, a debate on the uh, Syrian and Iraqi heritage, uh, equally as we did the uh, beginning of June uh, with a major conference of experts uh, in uh, Berlin with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Germany to look at the ways to protect the Syrian heritage. Um, I would say something, repeat something that Alice, my dear friend, the minister, uh, just said, the importance of, of heritage and of culture, identities, our common understanding about humanity. Uh, and to say that uh, because of the conflict, because of the horrific, uh, shocking destruction uh, that we have seen in Syria, uh, in Iraq, which in my view, reveals the true face of violent extremism because it is not by chance that they destroyed it is uh, and this is the new uh, tendency that is emerging the deliberate destruction of heritage it is not a collateral damage uh, anymore um, I think this started with the destruction of the Buddhas in Bamiyan and uh, we were so shocked and we thought that it will never going to be repeated that it's an aberration and that in the 21st century in the our uh, civilized world where we have a common understanding about uh, heritage, this will not happen. Then we see the destruction of mausoleums in Timbuktu, uh, and the burning of the manuscripts uh, that uh, uh, created the wisdom of millennium of, uh, of years of Islamic uh, astronomy, of medicine, of philosophy, of everything that uh, uh, this culture has given to the world. And then we move to the destruction uh, in Syria and Iraq. And I think why it is important this debate nowadays, of course, we can say many things of what we are doing, uh, starting with working with the International Red Cross, with the humanitarians, with the Security Council, with Interpol on the illicit trafficking of antiquities, uh, to stop the looting, to stop the demand, uh, working with partners, establishing an observatory for Syrian heritage in Beirut in our office, uh, and uh, many, many, many other, other activities, uh, uh, including mobilizing a new strategy of the European Union just launched for cultural diplomacy, including the protection of, of heritage, which is very important. But I think what is, uh, um, in my view, critical to understand nowadays is the importance of protect and protecting of heritage. Uh, and it's, uh, I would say it's becoming uh, a security imperative to link it with a humanitarian disaster and not to say we have to choose between saving human lives or saving heritage, which was at the beginning of the Syrian crisis 
difficult for us a message to pass and UNESCO was criticized and I personally was criticized that while there is a humanitarian people were dying and uh, many people were coming and saying oh stop speaking about bricks and stones and to say why it matters for us as a single humanity as a as a global I would say outreach this already is there I think it's obvious that human suffering and strategic and security and peace is very much linked also to protecting of heritage. Yes, I'm very glad that you brought mm -hmm. that up because that was that's really the part of all this, isn't it? That human lives uh, and, and uh, cultural heritage should not be put against each other. So if we ju should just freeze time right now, what would be the main challenge uh, in this conflict? If you could do one thing, Right now. Well, of course, uh, the main challenge is to stop further destruction. Mm. Unfortunately, we don't have armies. Uh, we don't have uh, any way to intervene there where there is still conflict. But uh, working with local communities, continuing explaining to them, and maybe the very concrete uh, action that we can do, it is to stop the illicit trafficking of objects of art yeah. and consequently financing of extremism. Good. This may be number one. Yeah, we'll come back to that one. Thank you very much, Madame Bukova. And now, Lars Amrius, I have a question for you. Why is cultural heritage such an explicit target in international conflicts? We've seen it in Iraq and Syria, former Yugoslavia, etc. What would you say? Well, well f f first of all, I would like to ag agree with, with Madame Bukova that uh, we've certainly seen a surge, I think, in, in deliberate attacks on cultural heritage in, in recent times. Uh, however, this is not a new phenomenon, as you said in the introduction. Uh, I, I think th there's a very short answer to your question, uh, and I would like to quote uh, a famous author, George Orwell, of course, who in his book 1984 has Big Brother say that he who controls the past owns the future. Mm. He who controls the past owns the future. So there's a power perspective in this. Uh, and and Powerful men, because th it's almost always been men, uh, has always known this and, and has uh, used the control of the past through heritage to further their purposes. And of course, ISIS, Daesh, uh, other terrorist organizations, they know this too. And, and they're trying to use this for, for their purposes. It, it's been built into their twisted ideology uh, and it's been used, at least it's been suggested that, that their tactics is used also to, uh, and this is new for our time, I think, uh, it's, it's used also to get media attention, to, because they, they need constant attention in media in, able to be, uh, in order to be able to attract new recruits, attract new financing. So it's been used very deliberately in, in, in this conflict, uh, especially. But it's actually a phenomenon that we've seen for a long, long time. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Charlotte Peter Gornitska, uh, from a SIDA perspective, in what way can international aid to cultural heritage make a difference in conflict zones, do you think? Well, what we, what we do and what SEED has done for many years is that we have been supporting organizations that safeguards and, and preserve cultural heritage. And we know, by, we know that it serves people. It gives back hope to see that buildings can be renovated, that mosques are there, and that the identity uh, for people and empowerment that comes with that uh, is a means of, of rebuilding hope for the future. It's very practical. It's, it's about supporting organizations like Cultural Heritage Without Borders, uh, which was working physically uh, in the Balkans and now in Syria with do, doing all of that, but also working hard to uh, transfer this knowledge to local organizations and civil society in country. So that's examples of what we can do. But I think it's important to, to stress that it's not about buildings only, it's also about other expressions of culture like music, theatre, mm. arts. And, and we find it a bit hard here because we also know that culture is digital uh, today. <laughs> and how do we know when we give an opportunity for people to have a voice, which this is about, that we don't serve 
uh, the power that we're not there to serve. It's, it's actually a bit more complex. Uh, we have to learn more to do the analysis behind uh, where the power is in, in, in these difficult situations. In Palestine, we do a lot of work uh, on drama and arts uh, because we want people in Palestine to be able to tell their story because the story is told by others uh, and the view of the conflict is very much by others. So by allowing organizations to support people within difficult areas like Gaza uh, to express themselves and to express them through music, through building instruments, through local folklore and things like that, we see that they are in charge of their own story, which is very, very important for identity. And these are the kinds of projects and programs that we support, but we are governed by the government. We used to do this more than we do today because we don't have a special budget for culture. It's part of what we, what we call working for democracy and human rights, but it's not expressed as culture as such today, which was the fact 10 years ago. So our colleagues, they complain. They say, you do too little. I see. Well, this is almost a direct question to you, Minister. Yeah. Would you like to, to comment <laughs> on that? Yeah, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, well, uh, I partly agree, but at the same time, we also have increased our, our work when it comes to UNESCO. And yes. so we're doing yeah. the work, but through other channels, uh, which has been uh, increasing even more if we explain what is not there. So um, we're still on the right side. But then we can, we can use different tools, of course, but we're mm. using other tools right now. Uh. Fine, thank so you. Yeah. No, please. No, I mean, uh, you know, maybe you all know that, but Sweden is the third biggest financer for UNESCO's work. So, I mean, we are UNESCO. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, I think, that's no, but true. that is very important. That's I mean, we, the, we are all member countries. That's so, true. so when we have so many different, I mean, and I think we Swedes could be very proud of that, yes. what we are doing in the world uh, through UNESCO. And that's why we also have increased our, the, the work and the focus. And we think UNESCO is a very important tool, the government to be able to, to do the feministic uh, politics that we we are, are driving. We see UNESCO as, as a, a main one of our main tools. So I mean, this is important to to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can only confirm this. <laughs> <laughs> That's and I would say that not only Sweden is uh, the the third. Uh, uh, biggest donors, but what is very important is that Sweden is there where really priorities are and where needs are and supporting our core important uh, core activities. Uh, uh, and in this particular case, I think it's important to understand that uh, uh, protecting of heritage, and this is, uh, and I would pick up from uh, what you just said about citing uh, George Orwell and uh, all our thinking around it. Uh, I was at such a debate recently and the uh, Jordanian Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Nasser Judith, a good friend. Uh, we were discussing uh, once again extremism and uh, uh, youth radicalization, destruction of heritage, and he was uh, showing how all this is very much linked. And he said, he told me, he said, you know, Irina, my son, my own son, uh, which is a teenager, uh, was uh, telling me, you know, uh, uh, that extremists are destroying this because history delegitimizes them. And I think he's so right, because history shows that we are diverse, that there is multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. History shows that people from Christian, Muslim, Jewish faith were living in Iraq for ages and in Syria, and they want to destroy this diversity. Mm -hmm. And that is why I, I, I call this cultural cleansing, because it's you destroy, you persecute minorities, you destroy their heritage, you destroy their history, their temples, and all of a sudden they want to erase memories mm -hmm. where we came from, from the Middle East, to erase that there were layers of civilization and of culture, and this is how we came. And the other, if you allow me, I slightly disagree I slightly disagree with uh, some of uh, what you said. Indeed, there has been always destruction in history. Yes, this is true. Uh, one uh, power came, another culture destroyed, uh, dominated, and the rest. This is true. But in the 21st century, aren't we more mature? Why the World Heritage concept exists in the first place? Why the convention exists? Mm. It is precisely to stop this. It is precisely to say, look, we have to stop this. 
in the 21st century, in the 20th century when it was adopted, and nowadays, we accept this diversity. We don't want to have a dominance of one culture over the other. All cultures are equal. This is our understanding at UNESCO. And we come from diverse uh, cultures and backgrounds, but we respect each other. We don't destroy each other's culture. And I think this is the importance of the concept of our outstanding universal value. We are all feel wounded and sad when Muslims in Timbuktu are destroyed because we feel connected to them. They belong to us as well. Mm. Uh, or uh, Hatra or Nimrod. So I think that uh, this, yes, it has happened in history, but we don't agree with this. We want to have a different approach towards common history, towards uh, understanding, and that is why I consider that the World Heritage List of more than 136 uh, seven uh, sites, maybe now it will be enlarged in, uh, uh, in Istanbul with the next meeting, this is the best way of the dialogue among cultures. We have everything there and we feel connected to it. I think it's an extraordinary concept. It is. Oh, yes. Yeah. Lars Andreas, you wanted to... Well, I, I, I cannot emphasize how important this is, and I, I, we are completely in agreement. Uh, I, I, I'm personally very much in favor of how UNESCO talks about the heritage of mankind. Uh, as a source of learning, uh, inspiration, reflection, dialogue across different borders in society, and, and I think this is key. And I think we need to be a little bit observant when we talk about heritage in everyday life, when we talk about my heritage or your heritage or their heritage, you know, because in a sense we should all be able to relate to all of this heritage. We can all learn from these experiences, these cultures, the, these, uh, the, the people, the predecessors that has gone before us, yeah. because in the face of history we are all equal. Thank you. But what, what is so interesting and also so challenging right now, it's even though we have the convention, mm -hmm. and even though so many countries uh, have been writing it, was mm -hmm. ratifying, ratifying. Yeah. ratified it, mm -hmm. uh, still there are dark powers around us, mm -hmm. even in Europe. Even I sit in Brussels with the other uh, 27 uh, countries around the table. I hear things when they talk about cultural health. I know, I sit there and I know that, what are you saying? I know that they have been ratified it. And they are saying things that doesn't open up, that doesn't uh, share the view of our cultural heritage as a common heritage. And this means that we right now in Sweden, in Europe, and of course in Syria, Iraq, but it's, I mean, it's quite easy to talk about this as a Syria-Iraq issue. I mean, of course, the, the, these uh, things are happening there that really destroys all of our cultural heritage. But the forces that are trying to frame it very, very thin, and this is what I said in the beginning, you and them and us and we are different, is here. It's here. So that's why this uh, discussion is so important, I think. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, really. And, and in that... Um in that sense, I, I was talking, about thinking about safeguarding and, and conservation of cultural heritage. Could could that become an, an like an integral part of international aid in order to promote just democracy and and uh, prevent conflicts? Do you think so? That's a question for all of you, really. Well, it is. Yeah, it, it is, is already. Yeah, is it is. is. Uh -huh. uh, we all our work that we are doing in Mali, mm. we have restored the 14 mm. mausoleums in Mali that were destroyed by extremists. Mm. And I, I, I mentioned this an example because I was deeply moved by what I saw going last year uh, to uh, inaugurate, to open against the restored mausoleums. Uh, I went there with the French president just a week after um, extremists uh, have uh, pushed away, uh, uh, were pushed away, and we went to Timbuktu, and I know the, the feeling of the local people. Uh, and after 1,000 years, they were once again consecrated. So you can imagine, it was as if I was giving back the identity to these people. Uh, it was an extraordinary experience. Mm. And I think there is nothing better in these circumstances than protecting heritage, intangible including, tangible, everything that makes 
part of identity of a people in order to tell them, now you have a future, now you can reconcile, now you have to move on, now you have to mobilize around certain uh, uh, development uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. And that is why, and Sweden supported us, we were so adamant to see culture as an enabler, not as a goal, an enabler in the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. Because without it, mm -hmm. it cannot be attained. You cannot have people mobilized around certain development goals unless they feel confident in their themselves, in their identities, in their history, in their culture. Uh, and I think this was key for us, and we did it. We, it's, mm -hmm. we have it here, not as strong as we want it, but still, it's a, a step forward. Mm. I think both... Yeah, yeah. Uh, Charlotte, yes, you can oh, start. We do it, you do it a lot. But I, d I do think that uh, how the issue is being addressed among development people, it is actually divided into that's culture and that's, mm -hmm. that's development and, and human. And the way we... The context is not told as you just told it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's hindering and hampering. And I, and I would say that we have a discussion that humanitarian... Uh, work and development work needs to come together and it's an opportunity in yeah. that context to address issues like you do right now. The truth is that there's so much bureaucracy and money silo, working in mm. silos and this issue is somewhere in between and not addressed fully by any. Mm. But an opportunity to use as a trigger to that uh, convergence actually between those two areas. You can do that, we yeah. can do that. Mm. Yeah, mm. you can so do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a promise. Nice. Well, well, I would like to raise another aspect of this issue, and, and that is uh, the issue of using heritage and, and how, we, how we, we view and, and use history in, in conflict prevention work, I mean, before the conflicts break out, because we see that so much of, of these conflicts is fueled by you know, images, views of history and past injustices and stuff like that. And couldn't we work more with heritage and history as, 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 as a tool for crime prevention, for getting people to meet across these borders and talk about the relationship to history, talk about sharing heritage instead of owning heritage and shutting others out? Yeah, so uh, I know this is the yeah. work is being done. I know UNESCO is working, mm. uh, starting to work at least in, in, in this field and in Mali and other places. I oh think yes. it's very promising yeah. to, to Very me. much yeah. so. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do you know yes, yeah, uh, I had a, a comment on, on, what, on what Charlotte, uh, Charlotte <laughs> said about the, the, the financing in silos and how you work with it. And I totally agree. And that is really a challenge, not only in, in, in this part of the, uh, on how we have structured our, our political different uh, actions and to, to st really strike right on, on the issues that we want to change. So this is something that we can do so much more. And it's also about knowledge different knowledge and different uh, science need also to work m better together to make sure that we really make a change and not only do like this because reality looks like this. So, I mean, this is a, a, a huge mm -hmm. challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When this seminar is finished, there will be another one uh, about uh, illicit trading with looted goods. And I, I wanted to ask this panel, perhaps to inspire the next one, uh, if enough is being done to stop international trade in illegal objects. Uh, well, so well uh, this, is, this is also a challenge. And uh, uh, we, uh, we the, the Nordic Ministers of Culture, uh, has uh, been working on this and also have been uh, written things together about this because we see it as, as, a, as a big responsibility for us in our countries, being one, some of the richest countries in the world, uh, where there is a risk that uh, these uh, goods and artifacts can be part of a, a trade, an illegal trade. And we also, the Swedish government has also given uh, assignments to uh, the police and um, other agencies to, to raise in the awareness and educate, because the, it's a lot about knowledge. You need to have the knowledge to identify uh, these goods, and you need to have the knowledge how to track and how to really uh, make this and put it in front of, of, of the uh, system, the, the, the laws and so on. So, I mean, this is uh, also a huge challenge. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, I can comment that too. And, and, and uh, like my minister says, uh, the, the, my minister and the Nordic ministers, after following the, the UN resolution 2199 that actually pinpointed this issue and, and, and took a strong stand against uh, illicit trafficking of, of cultural goods from, from this region, uh, that set of a lot of action within a, a lot of different government authorities, in, including mine. Uh, we've been actually uh, together with, with uh, Mats Durberg and other uh, colleagues and in many different government agencies, uh, working really hard with co coordinating our efforts, mm. trying to inform the general public, working with the art dealers. Uh, the police, of course, has, has a key role in this, in, in, in this uh, context. They've been actually able to re reinforce the, the uh, and and to hire more mm. police officers working uh, in order to prevent uh, cultural heritage crime so i think it in Swe in the swedish context we're we're really taking this very very seriously uh, following the the reaction of the the nordic ministers but of course on a global scale uh, the illicit trade with cultural objects it's it's huge you know talking about the the whole world uh, we're talking Billions of dollars being being uh, circulated and, and very often connected to a very very serious uh, uh, crime. Mm. It, it, ah, it's yes. a big industry, and and, mm. and we have I'm sure on a global level we really have to do more uh, in order to tackle this. And and one important aspect of that is is actually targeting the market, I think, uh, targeting the people that finds pleasure in, in collecting these kind of objects uh, around the world, but especially perhaps in the in the Western world, mm. being uh, people that are prepared to pay a, a lot of money in order to, to get their hands on this kind of, well, you might almost say in, in some cases, blood culture yeah. objects. Oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's a big, big challenge, of course. Mm. Yes, I look forward to, to hearing more about it later today. Uh, uh, Madame Bukova, um, uh, talking about the member states of UNESCO, uh, what can we do to support the work taking care of the cultural heritage that is, is being destroyed and damaged? The, you have uh, guidelines uh, for national actions and reporting, etc. Could you could you elaborate a little on that? Could one? I just say one word on the illicit trafficking because of I think course. it's important. Of course, uh, just one word. Uh, of Please. course, it's a big topic. Huh? I don't want to uh, uh, monopolize, but uh, uh, let me say that, uh, uh, and it's within the European and global context. Uh, of course, we have Resolution 2199. We work with the Security Council, and uh, I think it's a breakthrough because for the first time. Uh, it is linked to uh, uh, destruction of heritage. Uh, one of the paragraphs is about destruction of heritage. And illicit trafficking is recognized as financing of extremism. And then it's a security issue, security imperative giving a particular responsibility to UNESCO and Interpol. And we have created a broad platform. We are working, uh, many things changing, uh, exchanging information, databases, training, uh, capacity building, police authorities, judicial systems, corruption and all this. It's a very important work. But uh, what now the next step is, is to work on uh, speaking about Europe, on European level, and I have been in European Parliament, I have been uh, meeting uh, with the President Schulz, with the President of the Commission, Juncker. Mrs. Mogherini is very committed and putting in the new strategy, cultural, of the European Union that was mm. just launched two weeks ago. Yes. I was in Brussels, this particular issue. We need to harmonize, we need a new European legislation. Europe is strong in the export control, but not that strong in harmonizing the imports. And the feasibility study has been launched already there. And I hope the European Commission will finalize this. Uh, it will be by the end of the year, the feasibility study. We need harmonized approach in order to trace an object that passes somewhere through Greece, Turkey, Bulgaria, goes somewhere, starts traveling in Europe, and there is no harmonized approach to this. I think this is very important. And we have the legal instruments otherwise. We have the 1970 Convention on the Illicit Trafficking. We have everything at hand. If the European Union comes with a harmonized legislation, I think it will have a big, big impact breakthrough in order to stop the illicit trafficking, tracing and a huge impact also on other markets. It's not only Europe. There are other markets also in the world. 
The US have taken a new legislation a month ago. President Obama signed it, adopted a very important legislation on strengthening the import controls, and Europe has to show the same, in my view, commitment. Now, what can member states do? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Because the, uh, it's such a big area of, uh, of work that has to be done, of, uh, uh, as we say, training, capacity building, knowledge, mm. something that uh, uh, the minister just said, of customs authorities, of police, of uh, judicial, um, uh, working with the art market, uh, launching campaigns of uh, sen uh, sensitizing. Um, we have had a number of such campaigns. It's immoral, it's unethical, uh, it is just not right. Uh, to trade with blood antiquities, uh, as, as we call them. Of course, uh, strengthening on the, on the field, as we say, in different uh, places. Uh, in Mali, we have reconstructed uh, uh, the mausoleums. We need to do more into the digitalization of the uh, manuscripts, something that we are doing a lot more work to be done. Uh, we have established also our response action plan for Syrian heritage with the support with the European Union. But there is so much need, so much more to be done in all this area. I think it's the beginning of feeling really the heat of why this, mat this matters mm. uh, for the world. That is so interesting that you mentioned digitization. Perhaps we can have international aid going to uh, digitize some of the cultural heritage in, in museums in, in yeah, other doing parts the, of the world. Support we, of many yeah, member states. Yeah, so. yeah, that's fantastic, oh, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's time now in the program to open up uh, if there are any questions from our dear audience. We have uh, here a microphone, so please keep your questions short and to the point and use the microphone. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, we have one uh, over there, there in the back. Mm. Thank you. Um, <coughs> my question is to uh, Madame Bokova. First of all, very welcome to Sweden. No, nice to see you here. Uh, you met. You probably touched the the button. Sorry, Nuro. You mentioned uh, earlier that you don't have any armies, for example, to protect uh, any sites. Uh, the UN, of course, uses military in other issues. And uh, the question maybe is that if you would have the chance to get a uh, UN mission to protect a culture site, would it be in your interest to, to do the, such a thing? Well, I, I would say that we are already doing this. Uh, to give once again the example of Mali, uh, it is the first time that the Security Council approved the mandate of peacekeeping. Uh, where protection of heritage is part of this mandate. Uh, and not only this, um, at the beginning, of, even before this happened, uh, we, uh, in all these circumstances, we call the parties involved in a conflict, let's put it this way, to appeal to them to protect heritage. We give them maps of uh, the heritage sites or important historic monuments. Um, in Mali, once again, we prepared a very small uh, heritage passport with the importance in 8,000, every uh, soldier had it uh, in his pocket uh, with maps of uh, what is the importance of uh, why uh, it matters also for, uh, uh, for the protection. And we have started including the, in the training of peacekeepers of the United Nations uh, the importance of protecting heritage. The first were the French forces. Uh, they issued uh, two years ago a special manual of uh, training uh, military uh, uh, forces about it. And uh, we start to, to introduce the Germans also, uh, both peacekeepers and police forces and others. And we want to introduce this into the peacekeepers in all the different settings of uh, why, uh, why it is important. So we have started doing this. And the fact that the resolution of the Security Council already recognizes, um, it's, it's important. We have contributed also extensively 
to the Secretary General's report on how to prevent violent extremism, putting this uh, idea of culture, of heritage, of identities that matters uh, in his counter-terrorist strategy also. So I think there is a momentum being built and uh, there is a much more understanding and cognizing of the link as we wanted to make between heritage, culture, the security and the humanitarian nexus. Do we have any... Thank you for that question, by the way. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? We have another question over here, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Fantastic to hear all about all the efforts and all good things that happen. Uh, my question is about the long term. Our children, they see this on television all time now. Uh, the conflict, everything that's happening. How can we strengthen the teachers in the world to really uh, empower them in their teaching of young people uh, to understand conflict but also how they can learn that this will not repeat in history again. So for in Sweden, for example, what can we do in education Thank you. That's yes. an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Yes, I mean, who is uh, volunteering here? I mean, I, I can start because, of course, we can do a lot, uh, uh, and uh, from everything to to uh, make sure that there are a lot of uh, materials and and but also that we have the knowledge about how we are connected uh, as a knowledge about cultural heritage uh, the swedish cultural heritage uh, and how the swedish cultural heritage is part of the world's cultural heritage now that i'm so into this discussion and we are working with this bill and when i meet all the academia and the ngos and our institutions i can feel that what i i mean i studied political science at, on at the university of Stockholm. But what I have about cultural heritage from my school, from my up to, up to university, was not a lot. I know my Swedish history very well. I can point out all the kings and everything between, and nobody can w win over me. Or maybe some professor somewhere, but <laughs> I know my Swedish history. I know so. But I can feel that I didn't get the knowledge about the, how the Swedish history and cultural heritage is connected to the European and the world cultural heritage and history. So I think there's a lot to do when it comes to, to widening this knowledge, especially in a globalized world. Mm. May, yes. may, I, may I add to that? I think uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to talk about Sweden, uh, or I am. <laughs> because, we, because we said we are so connected. But I think one of the most important things that I think we do today is uh, in, with Swedish development aid and often in collaboration is, for instance, Rwanda, the Holocaust in Rwanda. We put a lot of our efforts into the museum and the memorial around that. And it's, it's a museum, it's physical, it's telling the story, it's using every cultural uh, media. I mean, it, photos, films, everything that you have to use to really touch people. And we're surrounding this with what you could say Swedish study circles, uh, with people, with young people in Rwanda. It's difficult because civil society is not necessarily what is promoted in that country. But we're trying very hard. We do the same in Zimbabwe. We were really, we were restoring the, the library, but not just to put books there, but to really make it a place where people meet and where children can be, you know, educated in their, uh, in their reality. And I think those are also means of safeguarding cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not about the physical mosque, but it's about uh, the history. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in combination with it, we could do more of that, I think. You had... Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting question. How, how do we use uh, these terrible events uh, in order to learn a lesson and, and to, to ensure that future generations learn a lesson from it? And I 
for me, a, a starting point is sort of that, that we live in a world right now where everything is, is moving really, really fast. Uh, people are moving uh, across borders, refugees, but also trade and, and, and money and, and stuff like that is, is moving Thoughts. around the huh? border. <laughs> Absolutely. Ideas. 50%, Ideas. I think, of, of the people living in this country don't live in the same place as they were born. Uh, and, and this is completely different just from a generation ago. You know, it, it's been moving really fast. And this, this sets new challenges for us working with heritage, but also, and, and also I think it challenges the concept of identity. Mm -hmm. You know, we use the word, uh, with the word identity, uh, and we, I think we really need to reflect about identity. Yes, I'm Swedish. But that's not my only identity, right? I'm European, I'm a global citizen, I'm a Uppsala resident. <laughs> and, and I'm much more than that. And, and, and I see a real danger in, in closing in and creating spaces between groups using the concept of identity. And, and I think heritage can be a force that we can actually use and relate to, to create dialogue between these you know, groups of people. Yeah, we really right. need to raise our sights a little bit higher than perhaps we have been doing. And I think this is a great lesson. And mm -hmm. I, if we can get this into the schools and to the teachers, I think we're really on the way. Did I mean min det, Chef? <laughs> Could I add uh, just uh, two things? I think I'm, I'm provoked by, uh, <laughs> uh, but by what was said. But it's important. Good. It's also Swedish and uh, and UNESCO and global uh, UN. Because just before this discussion, we had another very important discussion uh, with the Minister of Education and uh, uh, Gustav uh, Fridolin. Um, Fridolin. And uh, the discussion was about education for sustainable development, about education, but uh, very much focused on a new concept also that uh, we, during the process of uh, uh, adoption of Agenda 2030 for sustainable development, we came for. It is about education for global citizenship. And this is where I think we have to bridge these different ideas that we have. Uh, we teach children, but we have to teach them values, competencies, cultural competencies, understanding, living together. Uh, I think this is, this is critical if really we want to, on one side, counter these extremists and uh, the critical thinking that we want to instill, but on the other, tolerance, understanding about the others. I think this is uh, extremely important. And the second thing I want to interject into discussion, uh, it is about how we involve these young people now with modern tools, new technologies. And this is where we launched a very successful campaign, Unite for Heritage. Mm. Um, I launched this campaign at the University of Baghdad because we were brainstorming what to do indeed to involve young people uh, and to make them uh, stand up against this destruction. Uh, and we came with this idea and I went to the university and uh, I went to Iraq, I went to the university with young students. We launched this campaign and now uh, just a week ago or two weeks ago uh, we were told that this is the sixth ever successful uh, uh, social networks campaign in the history of this with predominantly with young people. And I invite you to join it. Because if you join, you will see everybody's putting their images, statements, ideas uh, on this. Uh, uh, it's followed by, uh, it's a hashtag Unite for Heritage. How, how many here are, do, are familiar with Unite, Unite for Heritage? Oh, yeah, fantastic. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I invite <laughs> the others to join. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because this is the way young people, they're constantly on the social networks and uh, we want to instill a different mentality, thinking about it. Mm. Uh, so, support it. Yeah. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I'm very sad. I, I was actually going to, to give you all, uh, you know, one minute for a closing statement, but I'm not sure there is time for that. Can you do it in 40 seconds, each one of you? Right. <laughs> uh, yes, would, would, yeah, would you start, Lars, with the closing statement? Just short, short. Um, <laughs> <That> <laughs> <you> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's really me. That's really me. That's really me. I'll, I'll, really I'll, 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 I'll do it in 15. Uh, uh, I think we sorry. need for everyone, irrespective of their background, to be able to stake a claim in heritage, to be able to relate to heritage. We need to, to view heritage as UNESCO uh, is a strong champion of the, the, the heritage of mankind. You know, we all share heritage. There's a real danger in, in 
overemphasizing the ownership of heritage. Her heritage is, is at its best when it's shared as a tool for learning and for inspiration and for meeting across these different boundaries, for learning what it means to be a man. Thank you. Charlotte? Uh, I think I, I've been reflecting a lot. I think that I have, uh, my perception has been that culture heritage is over there and development aid is over there. I admit, and if I admit, I can tell you th mm. that goes with a lot many people. And I think we have an opportunity in the way you, uh, you communicate uh, and plan around that. We need to reflect around because, and, and the Agenda 2030 will help us mm -hmm. because it's about identity, shared identity, it's about uh, development uh, and, and we need to reflect how that is being reflected in activities that we do with you or bilaterally. So I've learned. I'm <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Minister. Yes, uh, and my 15 seconds uh, would be that uh, I think it's so important. I would like to encourage all of us to be part of this discussion because this is hot stuff. <laughs> Not only in Brussels, you know. Uh, I'm, whenever there's a fika pause, I'm running around among. I go to you know the Germans because we are like this. <laughs> so I go to the <laughs> minister of culture of Germany and say, "Do you hear what he was saying there? Come on now, come on, let's go together to him." And so, I, so I mean, and I encourage all of us also at home here in Sweden have the discussion about cultural heritage around the the, the fika board here at the job board at the bus. What are people really saying? Because if you listen to the words and and be be brave. Get, even if you don't have uh, alt på fötter, go into the discussion <laughs> to talk about this. We need this discussion now. It's fem to twelve. Mm. And finally... <laughs> 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 and finally, Madame Bokova, I'll give you the, the last word for today's well, session. I would say that uh, heritage matters. Heritage is about who we are, where we come from, and where we are going. And um, I would like to see more people around this idea of Unite for Heritage. Uh, so let us take heritage as something that we cherish, something that is about our identity, identity of others, respect it and take it forward. So let us unite for heritage. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> let's. A small token of our appreciation. A small token of our appreciation. <laughs> Thank you very much. A round of applause for our distinguished panel. And... Yeah. To you, dear audience, who so faithfully comes to all the seminars, you are fantastic and thank you for the questions.